Now for a really, really fun topic, statistics. <clears throat> but before we do that, I just wanted to recap a little bit the last couple lectures, because we're going to build on that here. So with ggplot, remember that you want to specify which data you're going to be using in this ggplot statement and specify sort of the X and Y and other sort of specifications of the, the, the plot object in the aesthetics of, um, of this initial ggplot call. And then remember your plus sign at the end of lines for kind of each layer of a ggplot. This functions kind of similarly to the, the pipe um, in dplyr but don't use them interchangeably. Pluses for ggplot. You can add lines, geom line, geom point. Uh, we also showed you geom box plot. There's lots of different geometries that you can end up using. So I encourage you to just search through those and find applications for them. There's also really nice kind of libraries of different plots um, that exist in, in some of the like posit documentation. So. Take you, I encourage you to go look at those. And then you can, if you have a bunch of variables and your, your plot's starting to get kind of messy or uh, has too much information in it, it can be really helpful to facet based on factors, categorical variables, things like that, just to kind of split things up and make it easier to look at things. Uh, and then talking about these factors, there's multiple, there's as factor um, from the four cats package that you can use. Remember, its default uh, is to order things based on their the the order in which they appear in the data set, uh, whereas the factor will just by default order things uh, alphabetically. But you can set those levels with a levels argument in factor um, if you will have a preferred order for um for things and then this factor reorder is a really helpful function uh if you want to in a plot order things um you know in ascending order um based on another variable in your data set um okay just th that's the recap in this lecture we're going to cover just some very basic statistics um, and basic statistical models uh, that you would, you know, commonly use. Uh, those will include correlation, uh, t-tests, uh, and linear regression or logistic regression. I don't want your eyes to glaze over. Uh, we're not going to go into a ton of math here. Um, if you hated your statistics course, that's not our, this course. We are really just going to cover um, the very basics of these these operations and their output and how to kind of manipulate that data those um, those outputs in R. Um, we are going to be totally gloss glossing over all the statistical theory and formulas and math. Um, also, we are not claiming that we're using data um, that necessarily meets all of the assumptions of normality and heteroscedasticity and things like that. Um, so don't at me. <laughs> um, there are plenty of resources online, um, including the whole biostatistics series at, Ho at Hopkins. Um, so if you absolutely love this stuff, then I encourage you to go, go further. Um, we are just kind of going to skim the surface here. Correlation. What is correlation? Correlation is just a, a, a summary of how two variables are related to each other. So a correlation coefficient that you've really commonly seen, um, R is what usually it, it's called, is a measure of the strength of a rel linear relationship between these two variables. So sort of the strength of this relationship is um, how well these points may form a line. Um, 
So you can you can vary from um, positive one, which would be like a very a perfectly positive relationship, to negative one, which is a perfectly negative rela relationship, to something in between, which might be varying strength and direction of of that relationship. If you're really really interested in kind of breaking down correlation and some other code to look at, um, I take you, I encourage you to look at this case study. In R, there's a really useful function called core, which will compute your correlation um, between two different variables. So it you need to have two different numeric vectors, and this is important, because um, it depends on how you pull your data um, from um, like a data frame or a tibble. Um, and they have to be of the same length. Um, or you can all, you know, you can specify a, a data frame um, as long as the, the columns are numeric. And then um, by default, the correlation will be the port, the Pearson product moment correlation coefficient. Um, and that's really useful for just kind of standard numeric data. Um, if, however, you want to do a correlation based on like the rank of data's data, that's what these other options are for. So Kendall and Spearman are rank correlation co coefficients. So if you have ranked data, that's what you should use. The other thing, the other arguments here are, um, I say that the arguments have to be the same length. Um, this can accommodate NAs in your data set. Um, if there are no NAs, um, then that's fine. The default is just everything. It'll try to use everything. Um, but if you do have NAs in your data set, you will want to specify complete observations. And that says, I will. it'll only calculate this correlation based on the rows of the data that have new numbers in each of those rows. Let's read this data. It's a nice break to look at some code really quickly. All right. So does X have any NAs in it? Yes, X has a bunch, has some NAs in it, and so does Y. Um, so if I try to use X and Y, right, just these two different variables, it'll say NA. Very similar to when we like run a mean or a median or anything that on a, on something that contains NAs, it'll get just say the correlations NA, because the the default is this everything it tries to use everything so if you specify complete observations it will only use those ones that don't that don't have NAs an alternative to this core function is to use the core dot test which also can calculate sort of a statistical test for an association so is this sort of correlation value we see higher than you would expect or higher than expected by random? Again, there are multiple options here. You could do different correlation, different types of correlation coefficient. Um, this The default is Pearson. And then your alternative, these, these alternatives are all about the hypothesis that you are actually testing. Um, and so if you say two-sided, which is the default, um, it's saying that the true correlation coefficient is not equal to zero, either above or below. If you specify greater or less as your alternative statement, it's going to be testing that hypothesis um, that the correlation coefficient is either above zero or below zero.
So you can run core.test on this. Um, it does not, I think by default, core.test will just drop, will only do it on complete observations. So there is no error if I just do this X by Y, X, Y thing. So it gives me the same correlation coefficient as I got up here with core, but with additional output. Um, sort of, it's doing a t-test on this correlation coefficient. Um, so my default alternative, it says what my alternative hypothesis was, is not equal to zero. So it was using this two-sided um, and our t-statistic is very, very high. So we are pretty confident that <laughs> 0.92 is uh, greater than zero. Um, a really nice package um, for looking at output from statistical um, packages, st statistical functions in R is this um, tidy function. So this tidy function here um, is in the broom package. And it makes your, your results look a little nicer. Um, it kind of, it puts them into a tibble. Um, so I can actually, did I not load room? Let's load room. Library, room. All right, so, I can look at, so actually this is what it kind of looks like. If you just want to see what the core result, the tidied results look like, it just kind of organizes all of this output, right? Where you have a T value, you have a degrees of freedom, you have a P value. It just organizes those into a tibble format. Um, so you could save this and search it or refer to it. Um, if I wanted to like make a, a scatter plot and put my R value in that, I could just save this result and then kind of call this, I could pull this estimate and then put it into my plot. So it's a really nice way of doing it. That's a lot harder in this like, um, you know, this output that, you've, that you're working with here. Okay. Just a note, um, when you're working with these data, um, correlations, these correlations have to be, you know, numeric. So you're going to be, you're going to need to pull these different, um, these columns of data and organize them if you want to use this function. Um, the our statistic that we calculated, you know, of like 0.92 is really, really close to one. So for these two var variables, orange average and purple average, we see a very strong positive correlation here. Okay, we've covered all of this. Um, another way you could kind of make a better um, correlation plot with ggplot um, so that it, that standard um, plot object, it's harder to kind of manipulate. So I like to use ggplot for this. What I'm doing here is um, you can pull out, in, if you stored this um, core result, I can pull out the estimate itself, which is the, the estimate of the correlation, right? 0 0.91, 0 0.92. Um, and I, as I was saying, you can plot that in your, your R plot. So what it's saying here is, um, I'm just gonna like make a little label that says um, R is equal to as text and then right next to it, um, put in this value, this correlation value. And then in my ggplot, I can annotate it 
and put it somewhere in my plot to make it look really, really nice. So I'll just kind of show you how that how that shows up. Um, I can output this core label just for you to see that it does this. Um, and then plot it out. And we have a really nice correlation. So that's correlation. We can also, that's correlation for just two variables. You can also do correlation for a whole suite of numeric columns in a data set. So the example that we're using, you know, we're still using this data, um, the, the circulator data. So there's different columns that are, that all end in average. We can, select all of those just with this select ends with average. So it's going to think, find anything that matches this text at the end. And then if you use this core function on that, you know, subset, this, this data frame that's all numeric, and you use these complete observations, you'll get correct answers. The reason you have to use complete observations is a lot of these columns have missing data, so lots of NAs. So to get around, you know, it producing a bunch of NAs, you got to include this complete observations. But then you can see all the correlation between the different variables. So purple is more correlated to to orange, um, green is a little less less so. Banner is not very co well correlated with orange, um, and you'll see like sort of the triangle, like the the diagonal is all one because of course one variable is correlated to itself, um, and then anything below this is mirrored on the upper on the opposite side because like the correlation between orange and purple is the same as the correlation between purple and orange. So it's a symmetric um, correlation matrix. Another really useful function is the um, core plot. Um, so that's in this core, pro core plot library. And it will just kind of graphically show you um, how well correlated um, to these variables are. So again, um, the along the diagonal, you're going to have a correlation coefficient of one, um, and then it kind of reflects the strength of the correlation um, based on sort of size, um, and then the color is. Um, oh, sorry. The yeah, it's a bit. It's based on. Uh, yeah, the, the magnitude of it, so either one or negative one is, is size, but then the, the direction of that is based on color. So all of these are positive correlations, but some are stronger than others. Just want to stop here and remind you that correlation does not always mean causation. Um, and um, to give you a really great example of that, um, I saw a talk a few years back um, where somebody was looking at uh, Lyme disease, uh, which is a you know tick-borne bacterial infection uh, that's really common in the northeastern U.S. Um, and they were looking at uh, how well does the number of fried chicken restaurants predict Lyme disease incidents. Um, and it turns out, you know, we, there's a lot of fried chicken restaurants in the Southeast, of, particularly of this one um, restaurant chain. And there's a really strong, you know, statistically significant correlation between um, Lyme disease cases and fried tr chicken restaurants. Um, and it implies that, you know, maybe eating fried chicken is protective against Lyme disease. Um, 
but obviously this is probably not true um and this is a classic example of a simpsons simpsons paradox where if you aggregate a bunch of data together um it can give you some sort of statistical association association but once you de-aggregate all the data it all disappears so be really careful when you're doing correlations not to uh to really interrogate what your what your understanding and do you have a sort of a good hypothesis for why um correlation might be associated with causation so just a just a warning all right t tests what are we using t tests for t tests are really just to um to see if two means of a set of data um, are different from each other or different from some specified value. A one sample t-test um, will test the mean of a variable in one group. So it's just going to say, is the mean of this data different from zero or is it different from some um, hypothesized value? A two sample t-test will test the difference in means um, between two different groups. Um, so that might just be, you know, two different, um, two different totally different groups, two different locations or something like that. Or um, those two measurements might be from the same individual collected at two different times. Um, and that is an example of a, of a paired t-test. Um, Inside the, the R function, um, you can specify just X. Um, and in that case, you will be running a one sample t-test. If you specify X and Y, you will run a two sample t-test. Like the correlation test, we have several different hypotheses that we could test. Um, the default is just two-sided, which will say, um is is the mean value greater or below zero or some specified value or it, in a two sample um scenario are the means um just different from one another you know above or below but you can also specify less or greater um if you're running the one sample two test t test you can specify mu which is sort of the the null the null hypothesis for the mean. Um, so the default is zero, but you can set it to whatever. Um, and then there's some other things. So this confidence level is um, sort of your statistical cutoff um, for uh, confidence intervals um, for your for your means. Um, if you are running a two sample t test. Uh, you can spef specify either that it's paired or not paired uh, with this argument. And then the t, the t test makes the assumption that the variance between two different groups is equal. Um, but if that isn't true, if you've looked at your data and you know the standard deviations are way out, like all over the place, they're definitely not equal, um, then you could do this and say var equals equal to false um and it'll it'll adjust all of the the p-values accordingly all right so let's do some some examples here we'll run a one sample t, t test we're going to look at just the the orange average of this circulator um a note I wanted to make is the t-test is fine with NAs. It just emits them by default. Um, and the defaults there are going to be, you know, a, a null hypothesis that mu is equal to one, zero, um, a two-sided test, and a confidence level of 0.95. Um, so we know that X this the data set has some NAs, has 10 NAs in it, but I can run this just fine. Um, and it'll tell me 
the output of the t-test. This is a one sample t-test. Um, our t-value is really, really high. And so we get a super significant p-value. Um, and of course, yeah, 3,000, the mean of a mean of 3,000 is so different from um, zero. So the, t, the, the test is, is working the way it should. Okay, so that's a one, one sample t-test. You can also just do a two sample t-test. What it always does is it's assuming that the difference in these means um, is equal to zero. So it's not that the mean is equal to zero, it's that the difference in those means is equal to zero. Um, and that's a two-sided test. You know, So it could be the difference in means is above zero or below zero doesn't matter. Um, the default is that it's going to be a, a non-paired t-test um, and that the, var the there's non-equal variance because um, that's actually the more conservative um, test. And again, it will also just omit NA values by default. So it won't throw you an error if you have NAs in your data. So we can look at this, X and Y. X has 10 missing values. Y has 153. It's not going to care. Um, and so I could just run this test is equal to X, Y. And it will give me output just fine. Um, so T here is testing sort of the difference between the means. Um, and we can see that one is 3,000, one is 4,000. There's a really large difference there. Um, this 95% confidence interval is telling you um, the confidence interval for the difference between the means. I could wrap this in a tidy. Actually, uh, before I do that, Let's just see how this kind of changes if I say var equal is true. Slightly different. I mean, the 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 p value is pretty much unchanged, but you'll see that the the t value changes. It goes from negative seventeen point one to negative seventeen point two. So it's a really, really minor difference um, for this particular data set. It may change, it, that may, this assumption, um, you may need to inspect that a little bit better depending on your data. And again, you can wrap this in a tidy and get some nicer output. Um, oh, notice the other thing that's that's different here. So when it's you assume the variance is equal or the variance is not equal, um, the non-equal variance one is called the Welch's two sample t test. And that shows up in your, your tidy statement over here. So Welch's two sample t test. Okay. And I've kind of shown you this as well. You can look at your, you can save your results and look at them in a more tidy way um, and be able to um, kind of call these different parts of your, your, your tidied um, statistical test results. One thing we should always remind you about is um, the more test statistical tests that you run, um, the more you are likely to have a false positive result, uh, a type one error, um, and so we encourage you to always be doing p-value adjustments um, to correct for this type one error. Um, so say, for instance, I'm just, this is kind of just fake data. You might have a series of p-values from maybe you ran correlation tests for four different variables, um, and you get these this series of p-values. Well, each of those correlation tests is a hypothesis in and of itself. Um, so to adjust for this type one error, you can use the p.adjust function. Um, and there's multiple methods 
that are available um, to for p-value adjustment. Um, so this BH option is the Benjamini Hochberg, Hochberg. Um, and what that does is it just inflates your p-values um, by some factor. I don't remember exactly the math behind the, the BH one. Um, so this, this value that was initially statistically significant um, after adjustment is no longer statistically significant. Um, the other very conservative um, adjustment is the Bonferroni correction, which just multiplies by the number of tests that were done. Um, so for you know this this test that was borderline significant significant is definitely not not anymore. Um, this 0 0.31 multiplied by four just kind of maxes out at one. Um, the other, so bon, there's like different ways of doing a Bonferroni um, adjustment. Um, another one is just to change your sort of alpha level, which is sort of like your threshold for the statistical significance. Um, you divide that by four. So um, if this is 0.05, if you do four tests, the, your, your new significance level is actually gonna be four times lower than 0.05. Okay. R also has a bunch of um, really common statistical tests in there as functions. Um, if you're working with, with data that don't necessarily meet the assumption of like normality uh, for a t-test, uh, if they're, it's really, really skewed, um, then I would recommend using the Wil Wilcox test, which includes sort of the, the Wilcox and sign rank test and Wilcox and rank sum test. Um, and those are tests of the median. The Shapiro test is a test of whether something is like normally distributed. Um, the Komogoro Smirnoff test, uh, is helpful for just, uh, it's a non-parametric test to see if two distributions are different from one another. Um, the VAR test is your common like Fisher's F test um, to see if this whole um, heteroscedasticity is happening, like whether two different variables have different variants. Um, so that's this variance test, chi-square test, analysis of variance. They're all there. They all have um, defaults and assumptions in them. So if you want to use those, I suggest looking at the help for each of those functions before you end up using it. Okay, recap. Correlation can calculate the correlation between two vectors. Correlation core dot test can give you some more information and do a statistical test. Um, core plot is really helpful for just making a nice quick visualization. Um, it's really useful when you have uh, a large matrix of correlations that you're looking at. Um, you've got t-tests that can do one sample t-test and two sample t-tests. The tidy function in the broom package is really nice for um, saving statistical test output, output and referring back to it. Um, and then you can adjust p-values with p.adjust. Okay. We'll talk about regression now. Um, and linear regression is a, a way of, of modeling the relationship um, between two different variables. Uh, that might be um, one, ex one response variable and one expl explanatory variable, um, or one response variable and multiple exp explanatory variables. Um, it actually turns out that most statistical tests um, that we've kind of already been looking at um, are just specialized forms of regression. Um, in fact, a lot of statistics is just regression. It's just regression all the way down. Um, so the two sample t-test is actually just a, um, a regression with two different categorical factors.
we're, this is the, really the extent of the math that we're going to cover here, but it is helpful to kind of break things up um, into um, the component parts of a regression. So um, you can use this equation to sort of orient yourself. So Y is the outcome for you know, one individual I. Um, so you might have a long vector of data, which is your outcome variable. Um, for all the individuals that you're looking at. This is just going to be calculating a linear relationship. Um, so there is an intercept um, that is going to exist um, sort of for where your uh, regression line crosses the y-axis. Um, so it's equivalent to saying, what is the, the base um, response uh, for the outcome without any of the with without the influence of the predictor variable. Um, this beta term is going to be the slope, um, which we call the co coefficient. So anytime I refer to a coefficient, it's going to mean this beta. Um, and that is the, what re represents the the average change in y, the response variable that we would expect for a single unit change in X. So X being your predictor um, variable for individual I. And then this epsilon at the end is just the residual variation that would exist um, for this individual I after you've taken into account this, um, this relationship between Y and X. So it's it's equivalent to, to the error that still exists the uh, the residual variance. Just to break it into a little kind of cartoon here. Um, so you might have a relationship between variable Y, your resp response variable, and predictor variable X. Um, and your point points will lie along this, um, this line. So this represents sort of the predicted linear relationship between X and Y. Uh, alpha is the intercept. So imagine uh, kind of a line over here. So the blue dot is just showing um, where the line crosses uh, the y-axis. So this is theoretically what the value of a response would be if x was zero. Um, beta is, is the slope. Um, so it, imagine it's sort of like the rise over run. Um, how much of uh, a change in Y do you see for a given change in X? Uh, and then epsilon is really just kind of the distance a point is away from that line. Um, you can also model the rel relationship between multiple predictor variables and a given response variable follows really the same notation. All we're doing is adding additional betas um, to, this, to this equation. So beta one, two, and three are the coefficients that measure the relationship between y and the different variables, x1, x2, and x3. So what that actually tells you is the average difference in y for any unit change in variable x, one, two, three, while already accounting for all the other variables. Um, we will tend to use uh, this function GLM for our, our, mod our linear models, um, and that stands for generalized linear model. Um, you may also see LM, uh, which is a, a much more limited function um, that only allows for normally um, or Gaussian distributed error terms. Um, that is typically what you will see for you know linear regression, um, and it works sometimes. Um, but if your if your means are, you know, if you're working with only count data or um, working with things that are um, only zero or one, 
um, then this is not really the function that you would want to use. So GLM is the more generalized version of it. So that's what, what we're going to show you. The argument for GLM um, includes a formula, which allows you to tell it um, the different variables that are going into your equation. So you'll specify your response variable and your predictor variables. Um, and then it also will be, you, you have to tell it your data. And the nice thing about this, uh, the organization of this is um, once you've told it what the data is, so you can say like data is equal to, you know, data frame one, um, then your formula can just refer to columns in that data with no quotes, no back ticks. It's not, it, you really don't need, need anything. Um, so it's, it's really kind of intuitive to look at. Um, so an example would be if we want to model the relationship between a response Y and variable X, the R formula is just going to be Y tilde X. Uh, if we replace it, you know, where we might use a, a, a data set, um, say our data set has two different columns of data that we're interested in, in modeling the relationship between, um, then you could just say income tilde years of education, no quotes, no back ticks, just kind of blank, kind of the way you do like in a select function uh, in dplyr. Um, you could add as many of these as you want. Uh, so if you have three different variables that you want to model the relationship between, um, you can just add them together with pluses. So years of education plus age plus location. All right, let's actually dive into an example here. So um, we can live, load this ESD comp data from the faraway package. Um, and this is data about 44 doctors working in an emergency um, at, 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 in an emergency service in a hospital um, to look at the, the factors affecting the number of complaints received about these doctors. So there, each doctor has the number of visits, the number of complaints, um, whether they are in a residency or not, their gender, their revenue and the number of hours um, that they worked. So you can, you can kind of look um, at various things that might predict how many visits um, they receive. So one question might be, uh, do they see, do these doctors receive more visits for the, um, depending on how many hours they work? The way you would specify this in, in R is to say, um, GLM uh, visits tilde hours, and then your data is this ESD comp data. And then when you fit it, it will give you sort of this this various this this just data, um, the coefficients. So the intercept, this is the y intercept or alpha, is one hundred and forty, and hours is 1.5. So what this is showing you is that um, the number of visits that theoretically a doctor would receive if they worked zero hours is 140. Um, and this is the coefficient for how many additional visits they receive for each additional hour they work. An alternative way of looking at this that's a, that gives you a little more information is to run summary on it. Um, so you can just put summary before and you know put fit inside of a summary function. And it'll give you sort of the same, some of that same information, but also some, some other statistical tests. So again, the intercept is 140, um, but now it also tells you kind of its estimated standard error, the number of hours. This is your coefficient for the, the slope. Um, and then it will give you the t value um, for that slope. It's saying, is this slope 
greater than zero. Um, and the T value is very large. And so we are very confident that this is a, a strong positive relationship um, between the number of hours worked and the number of visits that a doctor receives. Um, you can also do the same thing. You could look at, instead of doing the summary, you could do uh, tidy. Um, and that will just kind of organize things a little bit nicer. Same result, really. You get a, your t your p value, you get your t statistic, you get your coefficients. Okay. So that's a very simple linear regression. Um, let's actually add in additional predictors. Um, so in this one, we might want to say, okay, visits, uh, the number of visits a doctor receives depends on the number of hours they work, but maybe, you know, people who, uh, doctors who are earning a lot um, also receive a lot of visits. Um, so let's look at that. Okay, great. All we have to do is have um, visits, tilde hours plus revenue, and specify our data. And it'll run just fine. Um, so the more it becomes a little bit more complicated to interpret these um, coefficients, the more things you the more predictors you add to the model. Um, but it really just boils down to um, you know, your intercept is now um, the number of hours that a doctor might receive uh, if they worked zero hours and they made zero dollars uh, in salary, which no doctor exists like that. So this is really just kind of a theory, theoretical thing. Um, in this, the hours coefficient is the number of additional visits a doctor would receive for every hour, hour worked, holding re revenue constant at some value. Um, holding it at the mean, we'll say. So after we've accounted for revenue, this is how many additional visits they receive for each hour of work. Uh, and the same hold true, holds true for revenue. So both of those, there's a really strong relationship um, between hours and revenue with visits. Um, same as the, the, the one with just one predictor variable, you can also the output it with tidy um, and get sort of the same output that's just a little easier to kind of navigate and and uh, call out if you want to use it somewhere else. What I've showed you so far is really pretty simple. Um, we're using just numerical um, associations. So all of these variables, visits, hours, revenue, are all um, numerical variables. Um, but GLMs um, and really linear modeling can also accommodate um, categorical variables as well. So, um, but it, it, the output differs somewhat slightly. In, in a GLM, the factors or any category, categorical variable gets um, special treatment. Um, and what it does is it takes the lowest level of a factor um, as the comparison group. Um, and then all other factors are kind of relative to its value. So um, say for instance, we have this ESD comp and we have residency is something that about each doctor, whether they're in residency or not. Um, and so 24 of those individuals are, are, not, are not in residency and 20 are. So when I go to do a linear model on this, the comparison group is actually going to be no, not a, not a resident. Whereas, and, and what it will actually show you is only um, the Y value, you know, those individuals that are residents in comparison to those that aren't. So I'll kind of walk through it once I show you some output. Um, 
but you can kind of you can look at that do specify it the same way as you do a numerical variable in your glm so you would say glm visits tilde residency and if you run this what it outputs for you is you'll have an intercept just like normal um and then the residency y so what it's showing you is only residency y because residency no is assumed to be the comparison group. It actually kind of gets, it's lumped in with this intercept. Um, so what it's saying is the intercept, it is saying what is the, the number of visits that are received by an average individual who is not a resident. And then for a individual who is a resident, this this estimate is actually the difference between those means. This is equivalent to doing a, t, a two sample t test. The difference between the the residents and the non residents. Um, so you could have more, th you know as many factors in there as, as you want. If you have um, a predictor that has many, many uh, different categorical factors, um, it will still do the same thing. It will pick a comparison group and it will get lumped in as the intercept. And then each of the other levels of that factor will be the comparison group. Um, so let me just run this data as well. We're good. I want to switch over to a different data set um, to kind of illustrate this for you. So we're going to use the, the bus data, this CERC data that we've they've, we've worked with a lot. And what I'm going to say is um, GLM of the number of orange boardings is related to the days. So we think that the number of boardings may differ a lot. The means may differ a lot by day. We're going to treat day as a factor and see what we get. Remember that factor automatically does things alphabetically. So the first level of that factor is going to be the one that's first in the alphabet. Um, and that turns out to be um, the Friday. Friday. Yeah. So Friday is the intercept. So it's saying that the average ridership on orange is 3,744. 3, All the other days, you know, these estimates that are listed for each of the other days is going to be the difference um, between that day's average ridership and the Friday's average ridership. And these t -te these these tests are individual t tests that's saying are each of these um, mean values for the difference between Monday and Friday, right? So the difference between Monday and Friday is six hundred and sixty seven, and that is very, very different from zero. Um, so we have strong evidence that Monday has less ridership than Friday. Um, and a kind of, that's kind of across the board. You have strong, um, really high p-values for each of those, or really, really small p-values for each of those. Um, you can sometimes see, um, oh, sorry, I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself. Um, so, you can also change the order here um, with factor. If you don't want Friday to be your comparison group, um, you could force it um, to use a different comparison group. Um, so let's take circ and let's mutate that factor um, to have different levels. So Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. So in this case, we've specified the order um, that this factor is supposed to be in. And when we do it that way, it 
it sets Monday as your comparison group. And so all of these tests that you're running are now relative to that Monday mean. So the mean for Monday is, you know, 3,076. Um, and so there's not really a very strong difference between those um, until, you know, Friday. Although, yeah, Friday, Friday is much higher ridership than Monday, and Sunday has much lower ridership than Monday. Um, if you if this is kind of hard to conceptualize sometimes, um, that this is the the comparison group and this is the mean, and all of these estimates are the difference between the means, um, you can actually output just all the means by themselves. Uh, and the way that you do that is within your GLM formula, you can say orange boardings is tilde factor day. Um, the way I'm doing this now, uh, I've recoded it now. So Monday is going to be, um, actually, no, I haven't. Let's just go back to this. So Monday, if I do it this way, Monday is still going to be my comparison group. So Monday is the first one in that um, in that order. But to force it to remove the intercept, um, you can just add minus zero uh, to your formula, and that changes your output for for your your test a little bit. So instead of actually showing you the intercept, it's going to show you all the means for each of these. Um, and so you can actually kind of look at them. You can look at those values instead of trying to do the math yourself. However, I will warn you that these p values have a different interpretation now. Um, what these p values are now testing is that these all of these different means are different from zero, not that they are different from the comparison group. So if that's really what your question is about, um, you know that that the ridership differs between days, um, then I would look look at these p-values um, with the, the, the comparison group included. But if your interest is just at kind of the means, um, then this is a nice output to look at. Um, you can also uh, specify interactions between your variables. Um, so I'll get into a kind of how to interpret interactions in a minute, but just the, the, the formula for an interaction includes X1, X2, and then X1 asterisk X2, which is just X1 times X2. So what that allows you to do is, um, um, have a relationship where the intercepts between factors, uh, like not only the intercepts differ between two different factors, but also, also the slopes um, may, may differ in regard to those, um, those factors. So if I were to have, you know, visits is related to hours and residency, but I also think that the slope of hours differs for residents versus non-residents, then I would specify um, an interaction there. So like if I leave just, if it's just this, just visits, hours, and residency, this assumes that the intercept um, between hours and residency is different, but the slopes are the same. We, we, we think that the, the slope um, for hours uh, is the same for residents and non-residents. But if we allow for this interaction, we can say that the slopes are different. Um, and the output will kind of help guide you to understand that. So, you know, this intercept is uh, is kind of the, the intercept for the non-residents. Um, so again, there's this comparison group here. Um, this residency Y will actually tell you the difference in the intercept between 
uh, for for residents versus non-residents. Um, the hours is the slope for the non-residents, and then the hours colon residency yes is the slope for the residents. That makes sense, or is that clear as mud? Interactions are always hard to hard to like really understand what's going on, but just know that this is available to you. Um, and I do want to actually like point out something that's that's interesting. So if you were to plot your data, um, let's actually just do this. So hours, visits, and residency. Um, so I'll have hours on my x-axis, y um, visits on my y-axis, and we'll color those by the residency. Um, and we can use this sort of geom smooth um, to plot the linear relationship. Um, and so you could use and the default for geom smooth is like a low s function, but you could specify a GLM. And so it'll actually look at the linear relationship between these. Um, so it'll output it and say, you know, formula used y is tilde x. But what it's actually doing under the hood is it is doing an interaction here. So it is saying hours plus residency plus hours times residency. So when you look at the plot, Not only do you have two different intercepts, right? The intercept for uh, for the gray line, the residents might interact intersect down here below one thousand, whereas the the intercept for the non-residents might is a little bit higher, right? That intercepts over here, but also the slopes of these lines are going to be different. So that's just that trying to link up GLM and, and ggplot um, to show you kind of how, what's, what this is doing under the hood. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, so this is the difference in the slope. So this one, the, this is the hours for the non-residents, the, the slope for um, the relationship between hours for non-residents, and then this is the difference in that slope. And that, and if you take a look at that plot, that does actually make sense. So, and and the the intercept is is lower, right? So that intercept is six hundred lower than this one. So, great, yeah, thank you. Okay, so that's sort of the the very standard GLM, um, and that. When you're doing your standard GLM, you're assuming that it's uh, these coefficients are 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 normal, and your error is your error terms are normally distributed. Uh, but you might also have other you know data that you might be working with. Um, so you might want to do logistic regression. So if your your outcome variables are zeros or ones, um, you might do logistic regression. Or if you have just count data, um, so each each outcome is just a an integer value, um, then you might use Poisson regression. And so the way you specify that is with this family argument. Um, if you are wanting to use logistic regression, you're going to use the family is equal to binomial, uh, and this uses the logit link. Um, to kind of link the predictor variables to the outcome variable. Um, there are several options for bi binomial. I think logit is the default, but you can also use probit or uh, couchit. Um, Poisson has a log link. Um, so this you can uh, you can plot counts um, or rates. There are a bunch of other families that you can look into gamma is another one that I commonly use. It's very flexible. 
So I'll show you an option with, uh, or so you, show you an example with uh, logistic regression. Uh, we'll use a slightly different data set. Um, we'll use this WC, WBCA data set, um, which was to determine whether a new procedure called fine needle aspiration um, could be effective in determining tu tumor status. So we've got a bunch of predictor variables that are uh, associated with the tumor. And then class is binary, so one or zero. Um, and this zero to one variable indicates if the tumor was malignant or not. So zero if it's malignant or one if it's benign. Um, a general format for you know, a logistic regression would use the same formula of y tilde x, data is equal to data set, and then you just specify this family is equal to binomial with a logit link. And if I'm looking at you know, my binary variable class, um, you might look at like shape and size of the tumor as predictor variables, um, and it will give you very similar output to your normal GLM, um, although the the interpretation is a little bit different because this is all based on like odds. Um, so you you still have an intercept, um, but you could say that um, a low this this inter this estimate value is below one, um, and it would say that I guess the larger the shape or the larger the size of the tumor, um, the less likely it is to be classified as benign, right? Because zero is malignant. You could do, you could exponentiate it. So let's say binome fit, summary of binome fit. One thing you can do is you could also pull out the coefficients of binome fit. Um, and you could exponentiate them with that. That's your odds ratio. Um, if you want to do that in a tidy fashion, let's do tidy binome fit um, pull out uh, estimate and then X, same result. Um, and I'll show you in a minute. This there's a there's a function for actually calculating um, odds ratios as well. Um, if you just kind of want to look at that, so I'll walk that through that in a minute. Um, I'll show this with a, a slightly different data set. So with the Epi Tools package, um, we're going to look at. Uh, some data about people who ate ice cream um, and got sick in the 1940s. Um, so let's let's look at this data. We are recoding it a little bit, um, so it's it's interpretable from the logistic regression. So we need to recode these why these yes individuals, those individuals that got sick as one, um, and those individuals uh, who ate ice cream. Um, y is equal to one. Uh, so let's let's just see that. Great. So we have just two variables here, ill and ice cream. There are ones and zeros. Uh, and you can just count the number. You can you can use this count function to just kind of look at you know, how many individuals who got sick, who ate ice cream or didn't. Um, so only 11 individuals out of uh, 29 who uh, got ill, uh, sorry, 11 individuals who ate ice cream uh, didn't become ill, uh, but 43 individuals who did eat ice cream became ill. So you can guess from just looking at these counts um, that uh, we're going to get really high odds ratios 
Um, but let's go ahead and test that. So we have to, here we have to, for the odds ratio, we have to, uh, it can't be in this like tibble or like data frame format. So you you're gonna have to pull out each of these into its own object. So we're gonna pull out uh, whether they became ill as the response and whether they ate ice cream as the predictor. And then we can run that in our odds ratio function. And that'll tell us, it'll give us this count table, um, just like we kind of showed uh, up here. Numbers are the same, 18, 11, 43, 3. And it'll calculate your odds ratio. So you were much more likely to get sick if you ate ice cream than if you didn't. And it'll give you different versions of a p-value, um, whether it's an exact test or a Fisher's test or a chi-square. Regardless, it's a really strong association. Okay. This is a just a warning. It is your responsibility as a researcher to understand the statistical methods that you're using, um, including the underlying assumptions and correct interpretation of the test, the method results. Don't blame R uh, if you chose the wrong test. <laughs> I, I encourage you to um, look at the resources that we've provided. Um, there's a nice guide um, on the website for how to choose the correct statistical test for the question that um, you're asking. Um, and it's also important to understand the R software that you're using. Um, that means the function's arguments and the meaning of the function's output elements, um, the defaults, um, and sort of what do the coefficients mean. Um, so quick summary. We can use GLM um, using this very simplified format for the formula. So you can just have y tilde x or y is tilde x plus one or x one plus x two. Um, you specify the data. You can specify the family. The, the um, default is a Gaussian, a, a normal distribution. Um, so you don't always have to specify this if that's just what you wanted to end up doing. But if you are doing something like logistic regression or Poisson, um, you need to specify that and should also specify the link function um, so that you can interpret the estimates um, correctly, the, the coefficients correctly. Um, but if you're just interested in calculating odds ratios, there's this nice odds, odds, ratio, odds ratio function in the EpiTools package. Um, but like I showed, um, you could also calculate those from a logistic regression by exponentiating them too. Okay.